There are seats still available up front, just because your Lutherans doesn't mean you have to say that. Yes, we Okay, we've got a we've got a great crowd tonight. Thanks to everyone for coming, and I think we're going to enjoy a great talk tonight. So, uh, and great food. Uh, so, I want to go ahead and uh, ask Pastor Flammy if he would come up and help us with the opening prayer as soon as he gets all of his food back there. <laughs> Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for your mercy and your kindness and your love that you have given to us in your creation, that you have created this world for our benefit and for our joy and for our pleasure. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that as we meditate upon your works, we would also meditate and remember your greatest work of giving your dear Son, Jesus, to suffer for our sins and to be raised for us on the third day, so that we might have the hope of everlasting life. Bless us tonight as we, uh, as we study the work of creation, and also as we have time of fellowship with one another. All this we pray through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thanks very much, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Here's our agenda for tonight. Um, we're going to ask Barbara to speak, first of all, and then um, after she's finished, we'll have some questions, discussion, and then we'll talk about future events and what will be going on this summer and so forth. And then I'm going to ask Pastor Lenny to close this in prayer. Uh, usually we sing at the end, but we didn't have a piano tonight, so I thought it might be safer not to sing tonight. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm, really, I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Barbara Helmkamp tonight. Um, Dr. Helmkamp has a PhD in physics from Louisiana State University and a BS in engineering and physics from the Colorado School of Mines. Um, she's worked as the Petra Physi Physical Engineer for Shell Oil Companies and between undergraduate and graduate studies. Um, she also completed the Lutheran Teacher <laughs> from Concordia University in Texas uh, while teaching at St. Mark Lutheran Church in school in Houston, where she was subsequently called. Uh, she's currently on the faculty of Veritas Scholars Academy, which is an online school out of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. She also taught at Credo Academy. Credo is a homeschool co-op in Lone Tree, Colorado, as well as having overseen her daughter's high school educations from home. Her older daughter graduated with honors from DSA in 2015 and is currently a sophomore at the University of Iowa. And her younger daughter graduates highest honors in June, and she's with us tonight, right? All right. And will attend the University of Miami in the fall. And Barbara and her husband and their daughters are members of Christ Our Savior Lutheran Church in Elizabeth, Colorado. So Barbara, we're so glad to have you here, and thank you very much. I am ready. <laughs> I'm very pleased to be to have this opportunity this evening. It's really terrific. This is a a topic that is huge, and I'm hoping to uh, help you all with it as I've. Um, spent some, re some time with in the past, and again, more in recent months. So, uh, the title of my talk uh, this evening, Heavens Declare, Starlight and the Age of the Cosmos. Um, this is a, actually a picture from our um, church bulletin a few weeks ago. It was absolutely perfect, so it found its way as the cover slide. Uh, just a little bit more background on myself. Uh, while I was at St. Mark Lutheran Church School in Houston, 
I had terrific opportunities to speak on create many creation topics and uh, uh, put together talks, went to various churches, and I have not had as much opportunity of that here, but um, so this is sort of near and dear to my heart. Anyway. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, to make certain I do, um, don't fail to make the main point this evening, the short answer to the so-called starlight travel problem, it's not a problem, so so-called, uh, is these sort of three points, and I will hopefully enable you to get your head and mind around these ideas through the, in the next hour. So, time is relative, and what that means we'll think about a lot. Uh, Einstein helped us see that. Uh, the universe was stretched, and uh, that would be something we can attribute to Hubble. And a very strong case to be made for the Earth Milky Way being at the center, or near the center of our cosmos. So those three things together will allow you to have your universe and see it too. Because what's the problem, right? The universe is huge, and that somehow the bigness of it makes us think it's old, because we do the simple math, and that's what we get. But we can have it and see it, so. So, uh, so the title of my talk is uh, uh, basically, where will you hang your hat? So how do we date anything? I have a few sort of ballpark dates associated with various processes in our uh, cosmos and our um, world. The first relate to cosmology. The second relate to, um, well, I guess geology. And lastly, maybe biology. And so they're all over the place, you can see. So if you see evidence of a process and um, you assume a rate for that process, you can back out a date for the thing. So Hubble's constant happens to have um, units of uh, inverse time. So what does a physicist do but turn it upside down and get an age? So that gives us something like, or less than 20 billion years. If you consider galaxies, the many beautiful spiral galaxies we have in our cosmos, and try to figure out how old they are based on how much they're wound up, you get something definitely less than a billion. And um, if you look at supernova, um, supernova remnants and at the rate at which they expand, now you're down to something like 10,000. Uh, so the spiral galaxy wind up. So these beautiful patterns we see over and over at all the various red shifts or distances out there uh, um, show this pattern where the stars closer to the center are um, leading and the stars further out are lagging and so you get a spiral they're all just going around in circles but the the closer ones in are leading the farther ones out are lagging and um, it's from this that you can estimate time um, for how old such a galaxy might be and then similarly with um, the expansion of supernova remnants, like this gorgeous one, supernova 1987A. I'm gonna need a drink of water, so. Cotton mouth syndrome. So just by way of showing some pretty pictures. Many of, we have so many gorgeous pictures, images from um, the Hubble telescope. So uh, some of these other processes like the, the radio halos, which would be the burn marks in um, granite associated with the alpha particles that fly out of a decaying nucleus and these mature burn features called radio halos um, show evidence of tremendous decay, and if you assign a decay rate, usually it's the current decay rate, you get 
very large amounts of time, something like 100 million. But you can similar, look at very um, other sources uh, and date them by carbon-14, uh, even diamonds, which are pure carbon, and you get much um, shorter time spans. The Earth's magnetic field, which is decaying very rapidly, we start getting uh, less than 10,000. If you look at the amount of helium that's in the rocks that was produced, those alpha particles spitting off of the decaying um, uh, nuclei that gave those radio halos, if you look at the amount of helium in the rocks, you get a much, much, much different date. So the huge discrepancy, so you see evidence of process, you assume a rate, and you get a date. And then uh, we can look at some biological ideas. <laughs> when did the dinosaurs go extinct? And the conventional idea being 65 million years ago with an asteroid impact. Um, some radioisotope dating went into that number, but then we find hemoglobin in dinosaur bones, which tell us they're very young. So uh, where are you going to hang your hat? So there's my little hat. Uh, but of course, um, we're here because we have a high regard for God's word. And uh, that's where we hang our hats as Christians, as Lutheran Christians. The, um, we take the scriptures at face value. We want to take the scriptures at face value. We believe they're uh, understandable. We believe they're infallible. And, um, and yet, we live in a world that's telling us other ideas. So my desire is to equip you to be confident, even scientifically, should I say, in a, a young cosmos position. So, and uh, I love this scripture because it's uh, in conjunction with giving the Ten Commandments, so you know, inscribed by God himself, so they're found twice in Exodus. And uh, I had a little piece in this book by Dr. Heck, so part of my history in getting my um, the colloquy certification to be a Lutheran school teacher at the University of, uh, um, Concordia University, Texas, um, was when I met Dr. Heck. He was on the, my committee, I guess you'd say, for my oral exam. And uh, he ended up writing this book, and I had a little piece in it, and so I put it up there because uh, he intended to call it Genesis 1, and so of course Genesis is very important. <laughs> the, the account of Genesis. And I, I like to put the genealogy from the New Testament just to remind ourselves that we can go from Jesus back to the first Adam, and uh, that's in Luke, and no matter how many gaps you put in there for generation skips, you're not going to get a big number. So we're looking at, what, six to 10,000 years at the very, very most. So again, we have a high regard for God's word. We can't disregard this. And what does God's word tell us about the past? It tells us to be very careful about assuming rates. And why? Well, there we sit in the modern era and... And if you try to go backwards, there are these points when God intervened in a, a miraculous and significant way that make it very difficult to extrapolate the past. And so these discontinuities in the past, um, the flood and the fall and creation week itself, have to inform our um, trying to, our, our cosmology, <laughs> our geology, all of our historical sciences, this has to inform them. So beware of imposing rates on the past, especially present rates. So what's the evolutionary view of history? Well, the Big Bang and the uh, what that represents, it's constantly changing by a little bit, but the core of it has remained the same for quite some time now. 
Um, it doesn't really look like a fiery explosion. That's why I have the question mark there. That's my focus for the rest of the evening. Um, but that's sort of the evolutionary view of history. Cos cosmological history. So when we look at data, I love this slide. It's very old for me. I might go back to the very first talk I heard Mike Riddle give um, quite a long time ago. I'm not sure where I got it. but. Uh, so it's related to geology. You can see the fossil and the strata there. But when we look at data, we bring assumptions to the data. And the interpretation we get depends on our assumptions. Um, but tonight, our data is uh, from the stars. And so the famous red ships, um, this is what's depicted here by this picture. The, the fact that the light coming to us from sources, um, the spectrum of the light, has been shifted from where it should be, and it shifted to the long wavelength, um, in the long wavelength direction, and so that's called a redshift, because if you think infrared is longer wavelength, lower frequency than visible light, and so redshift is shifting to the longer wavelength, lower frequency. And so that would be the, the light coming to us is redshifted. This is sort of the, spectra, the spectrum view, um, the one that's more comfortable to us, this is rattling a lot, isn't it? Is there a way to not rattle? I hope it's not annoying. Maybe if I hold it here, well, okay. <laughs> but um, we're, we're used to seeing the stars, the pinpoints of light from the sky. So that's our data. And um, so we're, I'm gonna do a two-fold apologetic where we look at the beauty of one particular, focusing on one particular um, creation model, and we contrast it with the rank ugliness of the current model. And so that's, it's a twofold apologetic to um, convince you that one is far better, much, much better than the other. <laughs> and you can be very comfortable with um, a young cosmos. So. So the scripture is the assumptions that we, that we would build into understanding the past, what the Bible has to tell us about history, creation, and uh, the foundation of the Big Bang uh, would be materialism, which means um, essentially atheism. And so uh, some of the ideas that come out of that are called uniformitarianism, and that's in general, it's imposing present rates on the past. It's extrapolating the past from the present. It's denying that there would have been anyone intervening in any significant way. It's denying those discontinuities that I discussed. It has a few discontinuities, but they're convenient for its own ends, but that's generally what uniformitarianism is, and the cosmological principle, which I will explain in detail. So, what is the Big Bang? It's the Friedman, LeMaitre, Robertson, Walker, <laughs> uh, Lambda, Cold Dark Matter model. <laughs> so, uh, Friedman, LeMaitre, Robertson, Walker is the metric that uh, solves Einstein's field equations. Uh, one of many metrics that solves those field equations. And Lambda CDM is dark energy and dark matter band-aids to fix the problems with theory. Uh, so the question is to evaluate this thing for its self-consistency. That's really all you can do with models of the past, because uh, there are many solutions that fit the data. And so uh, it's like forensics, figuring out who done it. Uh, you can really just look for failures of self-consistency. It's, it's necessarily circular. So you, and it's also becomes its own thing <laughs> and uh, becomes pretty quickly unfalsifiable because you can just add another band-aid and fix anything that comes along. So that's what we'll be looking at there. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's right. So I, I threw in this quote from C.S. Lewis 
because Dr. Heck is also a, a, a scholar of C.S. Lewis, so it's kind of fun. But C.S. Lewis um, speaks of the inconsistency of believing any model generated by someone who believes everything came from accidental processes. Just everything from accident. You'll see accident over and over again in this quote. The solar system was brought about by an accidental collision and the appearance of organic life. And the planet was an accident. The whole evolution of man was an accident. If so, then all our thought processes are accidents. The accidental byproduct of the movement of atoms. This holds for the materialists and astronomers as well as anyone else's. But if their thoughts, materi uh, materialism and astronomy, are merely accidental byproducts, why should we believe them to be true? I see no reason for believing that one accident should be able to give correct account of all the other accidents. So, um, I just make a couple little changes because uh, we're not focusing on the solar system, we're focusing on the universe. And, uh, just fix the first sentence there. <laughs> um, so we have a problem with self-consistency right off the bat. Uh, the philosophy denies coming up with a solution <laughs> because of the accidental nature of everything. So back to this slide, only now the, the other side of the coin, the, the biblical model, God said, <laughs> is the foundation, the assumptions that go into it. And I encourage you to think that one of the main issues to address in developing a cosmology, a creationist cosmology, is what is evidence of um, process and what is simply functional maturity. And uh, the best way to explain what I mean by that is the belly button question, right? So, uh, Adam is depicted by Michelangelo as having a belly button, but I would argue he would not have had one because there was no, uh, he wouldn't have had one by having been born. And uh, so he wouldn't have a belly button. God would not, I would, I think, show evidence for a process that didn't happen on the other hand, he had to be created a mature man because little babies die, they don't have a parent to take care of them, for one. So you have a functional maturity that fiat creation demands, but there's evidence of process that uh, would feed into a model, as long as one is constrained by scripture, to understand the details and to address issues we might have, like the starlight travel problem. So, other, I, other evidence of um, ideas like this might be tree rings. Would trees have had rings, the original trees? I would say no, unless they have a functional purpose for the strength of the tree or something. So, what balance of process and uh, functional maturity, um, what's the right balance for any of the many topics of uh, the historical disciplines? So Cosmology 101, here we go. Um, I meant to switch these guys around so they were in the same order as the previous slide, but I didn't. Oh well. So there, here we have these two cosmologies. Evolutionist one, Friedman, LeMaitre, Robertson, Walker, Lamb, the CDM. Or creationist cosmology, the one that I just think is amazing, absolutely astounding, is Hartnett and Carmelli model. So we're gonna fill in the columns of how these two models differ, but in the first square up there, we have the things that have in common. So both, there has to be a first cause for uh, evolutionist model, it's some kind of primordial singularity. That's all I can say about it. So, and then our first cause is God said. Uh, secondly, we have the Hubble law, and the Hubble law, Uh, v is a velocity, lots of equations, I'm afraid, there's no way around them. H is the Hubble constant, D is distance. Uh, this velocity would be understood to be the recessional velocity, the speed at which the cosmos is running away 
from itself, <laughs> uh, stretching, if you will. And uh, the distance um, would be how far away the source is uh, that corresponds to that recessional velocity. So the velocity is not constant. Uh, velocity is really tied to the redshift of the source, which is the frequency of the light, which is based on the, you know, the, the light source at a given star, what, how, by how much has its spectrum, its light spectrum, been shifted in the red direction. You can identify the atomic lines and they've been shifted down and it's just a matching process and you can see what the redshift is. So velocity is related to that frequency. So that's why I have F proportional to L. And L is luminosity. And from luminosity, because things get dimmer the farther you are from them, you get a distance. And so this is the relationship for the Hubble law. And so, uh, both cosmologies would share the Hubble law as being important. And then relativity. Both cosmologies would share the importance of relativity. General relativity, GR. Cosmological general relativity, CGR, which I will get to. And so the sort of less mystical <laughs> explanation of that is this intertwining of time with space, that they're not unrelated. So that's what relativity is all about. And then throw, throw matter in there too. So they're interconnected, time and space. So filling in our evolutionist cosmology, and we're gonna go through these one by one. Um, the first ingredient, the assumption upon which everything is, else is built is homogeneity. What does homogeneity mean? It means like your milk, it's been homogenized. It's one consistency. It's uniform in consistency. No matter where you look at the milk, it looks like milk. If you were in this giant vat of an unending milk, it would be purely milk. It's homogenized. That is the cosmological principle. That's the materialist principle that says that there can be no special location anywhere in the cosmos. And it is the foundation of Big Bang, the Big Bang um, evolutionist cosmology. Uh, and you'll see how that plays out. Um, then, uh, evolutionist cosmology adds some exotic things we've never seen. We don't know what they are. One's called dark energy, one's called dark matter, and I'll explain those. Uh, it adds an event called inflation that occurred at 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang, wherein the singularity expanded by a factor of 10 raised to the 50 in 10 to the minus 33 seconds. Okay. That's a band-aid. And then density fluctuations. I don't know what they are. Pressure waves. Some, some of them are spiral. Some of them are. They are pasted everywhere to fix everything. Okay. And there is no basis for them. In fact, I don't know. I'll get there too. Okay, and then you get the evolutionist cosmology, which gives you lots of confidence. Okay. Uh, a creationist cosmology. Okay, so under the evolutionist cosmology, we have this homogeneity, which implies isotropy. If everything is the same everywhere, then everywhere you look, it looks the same. So that's isotropy is wherever you look, it looks the same. Homogeneity is the same everywhere. So the Cretaceous model only assumes isotropy, and, and we're speaking of a, um, a broad scale to this, that no matter which way we look in space, it about looks the same. You could aim that Hubble telescope anywhere in the deep field, and you get about the same number of stars, variety of stars, galaxies, sources, and so you have this sort of general isotropy, but it does not impose homogeneity. It does not impose this philosophical assumption that nowhere can be special. And then this beautiful model, hartnett Carmeli model, it's absolutely astounding when you read it. There's no need for dark energy. There's no need for dark matter. 
So we don't need things we've never seen and don't know what they are. Isn't that a good idea? And then a very modest stretching is built into the model that's intrinsic to the time travel problem, which is not a problem. And it's stretching by a factor, linear factor of 3,300 on day four. Not 10 to the 50 in 10 to the minus 33 seconds at 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the singularity was there. Okay. And then instead of density fluctuations to account for stars, to account for galaxies, to account for everything, we have he made the stars also, which is a very strong foundation fiat creation by our God. It's much stronger than um, density fluctuations that you cannot have, which I'll explain when we get there by the second law of thermodynamics. It's not possible for this model. And then you have the creationist cosmology that I just think is amazing. So. So here's a, a book for you to uh, get and read on this topic. Uh, John Hartnett of the Hartnett Carmelli. If you want to pursue it, I just want to put it up there so you know a source to go to. So, first cause. What do I mean by first cause? Well, so it's the chicken and the egg question. You can't have the egg without the ch chicken. Sometimes that singularity is called cosmological egg but there was no one to lay it. So this is pointing to that inconsistency um, of, uh, of the Big Bang evolutionist model. Moreover, that egg would have, it's perfectly smooth, it's perfectly uninteresting, it has no yolk, it uh, has no density uh, differences in it whatsoever. If it came out of the quantum vacuum, as, as the argument goes, it would be in its maximum entropy state. It cannot do anything interesting. If it spreads out, <laughs> that's all it can do. You can't get the universe from that egg. So uh, not only does it lack the first cause, but it lacks any um, way to do anything interesting. <laughs> on its own. So it's the old, you can't get something from nothing. Uh, the creationist cosmology, God said, it's not something from nothing, but it is fiat, creation by our God, from nothing, by his word. But uh, so moving on from first cause to the Hubble law. So this frequency proportional to luminosity that uh, this gentleman discovered, um, to explain it, let's think about light. What do you know about light? Light is a wave, right? There's a wave-particle duality, sure, but it is a wave. We know what waves are, we've all been to the ocean, right? So, it's a wave. And uh, motion affects light. So these are the things I want to unpack. Light waves move at the same speed in vacuum for all observers. It goes one light year per year, haha, -ha, right? <laughs> or 186,000 miles per per second, or three times 10 to the eight meters per second, or the Earth-Sun distance in eight minutes, whatever units you like. So. And then motion affects light. Light is stretched when its source is moving away. This is the Doppler shift. This is like the police car that's going away from you, you hope, and not towards you, and the frequency goes down. It's a red shift in sound. This is red shift in light. Sound is a wave, light is a wave. It gets stretched when the source is moving away. So this is, this is why we have this frequency um, luminosity dependence. Another way of thinking about it is the wave itself got stretched out uh, when the fabric of space, if you want to think of space as a fabric, was stretched. So it's like a slinky, right? <laughs> it, uh, the wavelengths get longer <laughs> when it gets stretched out. <laughs> so it's, uh, there you go. Very exciting. And if you stretch it too much, you don't have a wave anymore. If I stretch my slinky too much, I don't have a slinky anymore, right? You overstretch your slinky, it won't be a slinky. It'll just be a long, straight piece of wire. It won't be a slinky anymore. If you overstretch light, it won't be a wave anymore. That's called a horizon. 
<laughs> you stretch it so far, you can't see beyond that point. So. And so here is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field where a certain place in the sky was aimed at for 11 straight days, 160 some hours in order to get as much um, light to, uh, I would say, expose the film, but then maybe that's not how it works anymore. <laughs> uh, and so this is amazing. You look out there and you see these light sources. And the little diamonds of different color are telling you the light shifts associated with sources that would be understood to be very far away because the light shift is high. Light, um, the light shift, the red shift is high. Red shift is measured, you'll see this dumb Z parameter. Why do Zs run around everywhere? They run around statistics too, I hate Zs. But it's just the ratio of the recessional velocity to the speed of light, V over C. Okay. So uh, the norm at one would be, um, so these are very high redshifts indeed to be in excess of one even, okay, greater than the speed of light. So I just superimposed uh, an image of the Milky Way that was taken from a an Earth-based telescope, and I have this little picture from good old Wikipedia of light waves coming to a person on Earth that, uh, let's see if I can find this. That bright spot is Jupiter in this picture. So somewhere near Jupiter is this observer. <laughs> and if the source is moving away, then the wave, the light wave, is Doppler shifted, you get a red shift. If it's moving toward us, <laughs> the observer, then it's blue shifted. So you have two types. You have motion within space, you have motion of space. So we're thinking of space as a thing of itself. And so you have these two actions going on at the same time, and you have to separate out what component of, of the um, shift in the spectrum you would attribute to motion of the source within space versus motion of space itself. But they're both really a Doppler shift in effect. So, back to this slide, I have a caveat. So the speed of light is understood by convention agreement, right, to be constant. Only the round trip average speed can actually be measured. This has some interesting implications. So, too far. So I'll explain those implications by a sunset taken out of our back door at our home. So why a sunset? Well, so the sun, we would think of the sunset as, a, or sunrise, excuse me. <laughs> this is definitely sunrise. Sunrise occurring at a specific time, but we're putting the time associated when the light is received by my eyes, whereas it left the sun eight minutes earlier. So it's a very interesting thing that you can adopt a different synchrony convention than the conventional Einstein convention called the anisotropic synchrony convention, and just, it's almost like a phenomenological thing, but you, there would be no reason you couldn't impose this on all of physics and say, uh, in effect, that light travels from sources at an infinite speed and away from the source at, um, at the half speed of C. And everything would work okay. I do not like adopting this convention. It's not my pr preference. It would fix the starlight travel time, but that's all it fixes. Um, and the, the problem with it also, I just bring it up here, because I know some of you would think about it, is it comes back to the belly button question. Because the anisotropy uh, synchrony convention, if you adopt it as your solution to starlight travel, is all the light getting to us because it travels at an infinite speed coming from the source 
then no, no problem with how far away the source is. The problem then is that when you look out into the cosmos, you cannot see any more evidence of process than about 6,000 years for a young creationist model. Uh, and so you have to then assume basically the entire cosmos was created as is. And so everything out there is functional maturity and, and there's no evidence of process. And I think there uh, are reasons that this is not the best choice. Um, plus you have Hart, Hartnett Carmelli model, so why? <laughs> um, like why not solve a whole bunch of problems at once with this beautiful model? So anyway, I just wanted to touch on that because some of you might have heard of it. Jason Lyle um, with Institute for Creation Research is a proponent of that solution to the starlight trouble problem. So back to cosmology 101, relativity. So I've talked to you a little bit about light, now of relativity. <laughs> I wish there were an easier way to grapple with this subject, but there really isn't. So I'm dragging you through cosmology 101. <laughs> so time and space being interconnected. So what does that mean? Some basic things. What does relatively, relativity mean for time? Well, gravity, that is weight, affects clocks, which is very significant and well established. Uh, general, this, this fact is used so that GPS works. <laughs> if you ever use global positioning system, then you have proven that uh, um, Einstein's theory of general relativity is uh, valid. So gravity or weight affects clocks. A clock in Death Valley runs slow compared to a clock on Mount Everest. Because the gravitational field lower down Death Valley is greater than the gravitational field higher up Mount Everest. So, this little quip is due to Dr. Russell Humphreys, who's my hero, next to Jesus Christ, probably. <laughs> anyway, I'm wearing jewelry that reminds me of him. It's a zircon. So, time is slow when it's low, and it flies when it's high. So you can remember, that's how you remember. So there's Mount Everest and Death Valley for you. So gravity, or weight, affects clocks. Acceleration feels like weight, but in the opposite direction, right? You accelerate your car and you fly backwards. <laughs> you push on the gas and you can feel that weight going backwards. So if you're accelerating, you feel G's, right? The pilots would know this well. So acceleration feels like gravity, but in the opposite direction. This is called the equivalence principle. This is how Einstein thought of general relativity. So, it should be no surprise, then, that acceleration affects clocks. So, since acceleration affects clocks, if the Earth, the Milky Way, is near the center of the cosmos instead of nowhere special. <laughs> then an outward accelerated expansion, consistent with the Hubble law, well-established observation, is equivalent to Earth being downhill compared to the cosmos in its effect on clocks. This means that clocks on Earth would run slow compared to distant cosmological clocks during an episode of accelerated expansion. Think back, day four, accelerated expansion. This means that clocks on Earth would run slow compared to distant cosmological clocks during an episode of accelerated expansion. So, moving on. <laughs> so, homogeneity 
which implies, iso um, implies isotropy versus just isotropy. Let's unpack this. So is it a centerless, edgeless cosmos? That's the argument for the Big Bang cosmology. Centerless and edgeless. How do you get a centerless and edgeless cosmos? It's fundamental to the atheist cosmological position, this principle. So here's the Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker model with no dark energy, which is how it used to be before dark energy was determined that it was needed. So space is like the 3D surface of a four-dimensional hypersphere if the uh, curvature, which is related to the mass energy content of the universe, is greater than one. So in this idea, uh, space is, un is unbounded because you go any direction and you never come to a boundary, just go round and round, and it's closed. Its beginning was a four-dimensional hyperdot. <laughs> its future is the big crunch. So if the uh, curvature is uh, less than one, then space is like the three-dimensional surface of a four-dimensional hyperboloid. Space is unbounded and open. You can go forever, but it never changes, and it never ends. It's infinite. Uh, it began infinite, just more dense. You imagine that. Always infinite, never an end, not closed, open, just gets bigger without, but always being infinite. Because it has to get bigger if it's expanding in order to get less dense. And the future is the big freeze. And then finally, if this curvature is uniquely one, you have a four-dimensional hypersheet, which, by the way, is equivalent to regular old three-dimensional space. So just think regular old three-dimensional space. Um, it's unbounded and open. It was infinite to begin with. The future is the slow, big freeze. This is the current model. Why? Because observational evidence, more and more evidence, more and more analysis of all the beautiful images uh, available to astronomers tells us that, what do you know, space is Euclidean. It's three-dimensional, regular old Euclidean space like we're used to. You see these pictures of triangles? And Euclidean space triangles add up to 180 degrees, the, <laughs> the angles. Um, in these other spaces, they do not. So this would be the Big Bang picture. It's not, the, this is so comfortable for people who like it. <laughs> it's so nice. It's like being on the surface of the Earth, only we're adding a dimension. We can sort of make sense of this, even though it's extra dimensional. But this makes no sense. Universe started out infinite, infinitely dense. Now it's more infinite and less dense. So some common sense is useful. So this picture comes from Hartnett's book, but uh, when the hypersphere was maybe a little bit more in favor, more and more evidence is telling us that it's this infinite sheet. getting less dense, getting bigger. Whereas uh, the creationist model uh, would be just uh, if I can, imagining an expansion in three-dimensional space of uh, a universe. <laughs> so um, it's a little bit more natural to think about. So just to see the difference between homogeneity and what it does to uh, the curvature of things, and then compared to just thinking in more of a very natural way about the universe so, and the past. Dark energy and dark matter, how are these, uh, why are these needed? Well, 
back, okay. So maybe I need to back up to this guy. So from uh, observation that the universe is just plain old Euclidean and it's flat, that would tell us that the expansion, if it's for the Big Bang model, would be constant uh, coasting. Whereas analysis of supernova remnants and other data has convinced the community, the cosmology community or astronomy community, that the universe is accelerating in its expansion. But that's not allowed for zero, for this cosmological constant to be zero, this thing called cosmological constant, which is associated with energy, and it's called dark energy. And so dark energy has been invoked a non-zero, a positive cosmological constant is added to the model in order to account for the accelerating expansion or accelerated expansion of the cosmos in conjunction with its being Euclidean. But in the Hartnett Carmelli model, uh, there is no need for either of these. So here's the picture of the Big Bang, both dark energy and dark matter. The green would be regular stuff. Electrons, protons, neutrons, everything made of them is called baryonic matter. And uh, the red, dark matter, is exotic. It's transparent. It's not baryonic. It's not been observed. Look how much more dark matter must be in the universe to make the Big Bang model work than of what we have observed. And then for this dark energy, this cosmological constant, and the um, mass energy associated with it is uh, 60, close to 70%, um, and it has not been observed either. So in order to get the flatness for the observed the one, the total curvature to be one, for the observed flatness, this baryonic matter component is not anywhere near enough, and so band-aids is an understatement. Bleeding out is the description of this model. <laughs> so this chart describes the problem. I'll try to explain it to you. So this column down here is the mass um, based, uh, let's see, how do I say this? It's based on the gravitational, um, the behavior, uh, one over r squared behavior of um, the gravitational force. The L is the brightness, the luminosity, and so these should be equal. The amount of mass that we can account for from gravity should equal the amount, mostly, of, of mass that we see, um, with the exception of some objects like dark, uh, um, like black holes, but they're not really, you can, they still have light associated with them, for, of things falling into them, um, so that's not really a ca ca uh, candidate. But this should be somewhere near one. We can admit that there's matter out there we haven't found, but not uh, many times more than what we have found. And these are based on the rotation curves of galaxies. You can um, go to large, um, bigger scale things further and further out, down to even clusters of galaxies, and the problem explodes for, for not being able to account by what we see for the behavior we think we understand. So this describes the problem of the model. So Spock to the rescue, uh, no, but he was from Vulcan, right? So uh, Einstein to the rescue, there, at one time there was a planet called Vulcan that was assumed to exist between, um, right close to the sun, always in a place we could never see it, because if it existed, it could fix what we didn't understand about Mercury's motion. 
And uh, so it was dark matter of a sort. It was a band-aid when, when what was needed was a new theory and Einstein came to the rescue with relativity and now we understand the orbit of Mercury without having to invent Vulcan. So this was a previous example that's just very apt. And then Carmeli, another um, Israeli, or uh, an Israeli, another person of Jewish heritage, um, died in oh, uh, the late 90s, I think. He extended uh, Einstein's theory of relativity to cosmological general relativity, and it's, he is not a creationist, he had, it, it was work that John Hartnett, who is, built on. So it's a joint model, but it was uh, work done by Carmelli that Hartnett built on. So in the Hartnett-Carmelli model, uh, we have 3D Euclidean space assumed. We have curvature associated with this thing called space velocity. We have density of matter, and we don't have any band-aids, we don't have any dark energy, we don't have any dark matter. And the uh, measured 4%, we have a very, space is largely a vacuum, 4% matter is uh, predicted by the theory and measured. So it's a fabulous um, correlation. So, my time is running out. This is a galaxy from Ursa Major, a pinwheel galaxy, it's a spiral. So let me explain, try to explain this issue. So the Big Bang cosmology supposes there is some dark matter halo, a big concentric sphere around the galaxy that uh, has enough mass associated with it that you can fix the um, behavior of the one over r squared force so that it generates the speeds that are observed for the stars that are going around. Okay. Remember, they, they lag, the ones in the middle, but these guys out here don't lag nearly enough. They're going way too fast. Um, I might, did I say it backwards? That's right, they go too fast. And so dark matter is proposed to solve that. Whereas with the, and this is just really, really cool, with the Hartnett Carmelli model, the, um, I've always wondered why the stuff in space moves independently of space. I mean, if you have a piece of fabric and you paint something on it and you stretch the fabric, the applique or the picture, the image, the ink stretches with it. There's gotta be some coupling between the two and basically that's what Carmelli's model does. And so there are different regimes where depending on the strength of the gravity, either the space, stretching of space dominates behavior or the, um, uh, or it doesn't. So you have a good old Newtonian regime where it's a one over R squared force, and then you have basically this CGR, uh, cosmological general relativity regime, where it's a one over R force. And that in fact is what has many, has, many have observed that those outer stars in these halo, in these um, spiral galaxies are acting like it's a one over R force, the inner ones like one over R squared. And uh, beautiful work in this book resolves this. There's even a theory, a phenomenological one, called MOND that someone has proposed it's a one over R force, but there's no theoretical basis for it. It's more like, like Ohm's law or something that's not based from first principles. But here we have a model from first principles that explains spiral galaxies, and it's absolutely astounding. So, on to the next item, the inflation stre stretching. Uh, comparison, maybe it speaks for itself, but I do have to get to this slide. So here's a, in the creation model, what would be happening on 
day four, if there was an accelerated stretching episode, then because of the effect of motion on clocks, the clocks on Earth, depending on how fast or quickly this accelerated stretching happened, would go very slow. And the clocks in the cosmos, depending on how far away, <laughs> um, would uh, go at a normal or basically faster. So we start out at the same speed, same rate, um, and then it got accelerated, the cosmos stretched it out on day four. It would have been um, allow for many, many years of process according to uniformitarian assumptions, but that would have all occurred on that one day. That accelerated stretching episode would end by the end of the day, uh, and here we are. <laughs> so perfectly allowed within the laws of, um, with, with our understanding of relativity, which is well established, you can account for um, by a past accelerated stretching episode by the, you can account for the bigness of the universe and being able to see all of it. And this is extremely clever due to Hartnett, that cosmic microwave radiation, um, the CMB, the cosmic uh, microwave, microwave background radiation is at 2.7 K according to uh, what's called black body radiation, that would be the temperature of space. If it was visible light to begin with, and uh, that's about a 9,000 Kelvin temperature from black body radiation profile, just divide the two and you get the factor of stretching. It's really pretty slick. Uh, so, in the beginning God said, um, in the beginning God created the heavens of the earth. The earth was formless and void. Darkness was on the face, face of the deep. The Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the water. Um, and God said, let there be light. Very first thing, light. Visible light, presumably, because that's all, that's what we assume it would be. And so that the cosmic microwave background radiation could very well be that first light God made that has got stretched in that accelerated stretching episode on day four. And it's really, really quite clever. I'm gonna skip that. Whereas day five and after, the clocks would run at the same rate because the accelerated stretching episode would be over. And uh, that's what's been for the last 6,000 years. So I need to wrap up, I know that. So I, I'm not gonna be able to talk about all these other, this other idea. I wish I could. Um, I think the time is out. Read my slide. <laughs> So this one, rescuing devices that are propping up the Big Bang, dark matter to account for excess mass luminosity ratios that get bigger the farther you go out, dark energy, which is a positive cosmological constant, to account for the expansion of space given its Euclideanness, its flatness, but the calculated vacuum energy from quantum field theory, which I don't have a lot of confidence in, by the way, and the cosmological constant differ by a factor of 10 to the 120. Okay. Four, four spatial dimensions, effectively, uh, are what the Big Bang cosmology works with to avoid having Earth at the center. The only reason for it, and it's contrived, and uh, it's not... Uh, Intuitive, and it's forced. It's rejection of God. But not everybody knows that. They just learned it in school, right? Density fluctuations, we can talk about that. Inflation, 10 to the 50-fold growth. 
in 10 to the minus 30 seconds. That's 33 seconds. That's an interval. <laughs> and then uh, that was at 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang. And why? To prevent gravitational collapse, the early highly dense universe, due to density fluctuations, which we didn't get to, to dilute the monopole problem. There are no magnetic monopoles, so the idea is that they're just so dilute we don't see them. And to fix the, their version of the horizon problem, which relates to the cosmic microwave background radiation being so smooth. So there we go. It's a statement online, you can sign, I signed. I don't have time to talk about those things, they're very interesting. They support the, I, well maybe this one, no. <laughs> um, no. So. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. This is good old Sherlock Holmes, but I need to change it a little bit. When you have eliminated the truth, scriptural um, discontinuities in the past that God tells us about, and the time frame he tells us about, if you eliminate it, whatever remains, however outrageous, must be, oh, propped up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so cosmological general relativity should have taken over by now. It's such a beautiful theory. It explains so many things, but it does not have the cosmological principle underneath it. So it is rejected. General relativity you can choose it, you can impose the cosmological principle on it, the homogeneity, or not. But the, and general relativity is widely accepted. If you want to merge these two theories in the middle, the large scale motion of the universe down to the special relativity which ignores matter, if you want to merge these two theories, the only resolution is to require past time dilation with an accelerated expansion of the universe. So this theory, cosmological general relativity, is so beautiful and so simple. This one is so beautiful and so highly regarded. If you want them both, you have to have time dilation. So it's uh, kind of amazing. So we have a coupling of the matter um, and the cosmos to explain these guys. So, where will you hang your hat? I got a point to make, and I'm not gonna make it. <laughs> Interest of time. Um, from, a, uh, from the scriptures again, who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom and by his understanding, stretched out the heavens. There are many places in the scripture that use this expression. Uh, it's pretty cool. And so why do I have a, a light show? Because when we look out at the cosmos, we are, because of the um, accelerated stretching and mechanisms associated with it, uh, potentially matter being pulled out of the, um, the vacuum in a show of uh, the active galactic nuclei producing more stars, we look out at the cosmos with the Hubble and we see Day four light show. And so the short answer, time is relative. The universe was stretched. The Milky Way is near the center. You can have your universe. You can see it too. And the science is beautiful. I really am amazed at it. He made the stars also. Such a small phrase so significant. He made the stars also. And that's all. So. I would love to do that with you. I tried to say too much. I knew I tried to say too much, but so often these talks don't give details and I wanted to teach you some physics on, along the way. So. <laughs> so you just got stuck with that of a physics teacher. What do you expect? Yes? I just want to understand something about the secular cosmology. Yes. Um, when, we, when we're looking at those Hubble shots, 
of the um, constellations and the beautiful shapes that they were in, um, that would imply that if there was this expansion of 10 to the 55th, that uh, that would probably look more like uh, like what the universe should look like immediately after the Big Bang with no formations of things. Uh, uh, I would have thought that anything coming from, from that distance would have looked like what would happen that just right after the uh, Big Bang, no organized uh, constellations. To get the drift of my question. Yes, yeah, that, that hint at population, um, I always get one and three confused. What did it say, population one or three? Three, thank you. <laughs> population three stars would be supposedly these very young stars. They're, they're not found. And so everyone with looking deeper and deeper into the cosmos with these extremely long exposure Hubble photos was we're going to see finally by looking farther and farther out these less formed, these younger, according to our idea of the process, sources and they have not showed up. Instead, we see those same spiral galaxies over and over and over going further and farther out. It's just amazing. So is the dark matter, was that put in there with, with the with the halo around it to, to, as an explanation for that? Or? Well, that is a, that's a specific explanation for, we have, because we can, I guess, such a good job now at figuring out the frequency shift associated with the motion of the gas and stars as you move out from the center of a spiral galaxy, um, the, you can graph the, speed going around the, um, the center, probably a, dark, a, a black hole, very precisely, and they don't follow what they should. They don't follow the one over r squared behavior we would expect uh, from Newton. <laughs> uh, and uh, so the matter, if you, if you put matter, if you encapsulate the whole thing in a big halo of matter, you uh, can force it to work with Newton. So um, that's the dark matter, uh, and, and, and so you have to, you know, every one of these spiral galaxies, and you know, uncountable numbers of them, need to have this gigantic dark matter halo to make them comply with Newton, uh, and so that's where the dark matter comes from. The dark energy comes from having to have the non-zero cosmological constant thrown in to the field, to the general relativity field equations in order to account for the mismatch between the flatness of space and the outward accelerated expansion. So they're, they're two different problems. Okay, Does that help? Yeah, because <laughs> I've, I've been leaning on, I've been leaning on, when I talked to my Sunday school class, I've been leaning on the explanation of why do we have these perfectly formed galaxies at the edge of the Big Bang, so to speak. Right. Um, so there's yet another physicist, sort of renegade, not creationist particularly, Halton Arp, who likes to see uh, the really high redshift objects not as far away, but as newly um, created uh, objects that come out of the vacuum, uh, which, which according to, um, like by pair production, if you know that term from particle physics, then uh, that would happen when space accelerates outward. So that God would have created a whole suite of galaxies, but then as he stretched the cosmos on day four, more would come out of the vacuum um, in, a gener in a generative process. Um, and so you would, as you look out, you can see all stages of process. And that's a problem with some of the other creationist models, exactly what you're getting at, that you look far out, um, we, see, we see the same amount of process uh, at all stages, all epochs, because looking out is kind of like looking back. But, we have to think as creationists of a past accelerated stretching event when all this took place on day four to be consistent with the scriptures uh, as opposed to an ongoing 
uniformitarian materialist assumption that it's stretching now. The data is not, you can't distinguish. Uh, the, you can look at it, you can interpret it as ongoing or past stretching. Is it, is it stretching as we speak? Or did it stretch and now it's not stretching anymore? Or stretching at a constant rate, it's kind of confusing. It has to be accelerated stretching. So they're, they're indistinguishable. They're indistinguishable. So there's no reason not to put it in the past, get the time dilation, everything fits with the scripture, no dark energy, no dark matter. It, it's just absolutely stellar. <laughs> <laughs> what about the launch of the James Webb? And that's supposed to work, you know, even further back in time, to closer to the Big Bang. What's your predictions of what they'll find? I don't know about that project, so I can't speak to it. I would like to know. So, tell me, tell me again. The James Webb Telescope. It's going to be the biggest. It's the replacement for the Hubble. It's much bigger, and it'll look much further back in time. Well, so what that means is collecting data longer. Because the longer you expose your film, so-called film, to the light coming in, the longer you can, you know, even though, yeah, the satellite's going round the Earth, you can use GPS, which proves general relativity, to keep the eye of the telescope focused at the same spot in space for longer periods of time. And so you can collect more data. And that's, I would imagine that's all they're doing, is they're looking, they're saying back in time, uh, because they're going to get data that's faint, the fainter and fainter sources they'll be able to see. And so that, that equivalence of distance with time is, uh, is a uniformitarian idea. Um, when you, so, I'm confused. When I, when I see the sun's light, we agree that that's eight minutes old, right? Right. Well, then that's eight minute old. <laughs> It's I agree. Past time. Right. I agree. Right. And when I see a supernova in the sky, that's something that happened when? Uh, it depends on. Uh, okay. It depends on where your clock is. If your clock is on Earth, everything has happened in the past 6,000 years. Uh, the clock went really slow on day four, so a lot of process from clocks that might be out in the universe took place. But Earth's clock, because of the accelerated stretching event, went much slower, and so one day passed. And then, if the accelerated stretching ended, then the clocks run at the same speed. So, um, so 6,000 years from now, an astronomer who looks up at the sky, 6,000 years on Earth has, has happened. And 6,000 years everywhere has happened now. Then you wouldn't see any, any more. I mean, there's, there's information about stuff that's happening, in, you know, like supernovas or mm -hmm. pulsars and stuff. Isn't that old information that's contained in the light? It's process information. But old depends on what clock. And the only clock that makes any sense for humanity is the one on Earth. Right. So, uh, it's... You can think of it that... Uh, sort of think of it as putting... Um, the cosmos on fast forward. But that model, due to Humphreys in his book Starlight and Time, which kind of kicked off the modern creationist cosmology movement, had problems because you get blue shifts instead of red shifts. But that problem is resolved uh, with the Hartnett's work that built on, built on Carmelli's work, and so that's not a problem. But it's kind of like that. So, um, but from Earth's point of view, one day passed. 
And it's very weird, but it's, it's definitely allowed and proven that clocks run at different rates depending on how fast they're going. So if the universe is accelerating outwards, the clocks are going at a different speed than at the middle. And it's the centrality of the Earth or the, or the Milky Way if you want to go by extension. So it's like a galactocentric, um, not geocentric, but galactocentric idea. Um, the effect is stronger the further out you go. That's embedded in the Hubble law that uh, you have velocity proportional to distance. You could do a little differential equation and see that there's acceler it implies accelerating for the Big Bang model, but it is readily, it can just equivalently be accelerated, so a past event. So whether, but at slow, you know, so, but it has to be a very rapid accelerated expansion to get the time dilation that would allow all of the process that's observed in the cosmos to have happened in one day on Earth's clocks. So looking out in time and making out in space and equating that with time is a uniformitarian assumption about the rate that you're saying the clocks have always been the same throughout the cosmos when you say that. And we know from relativity that clocks do not have to be the same. And so it's the Hubble law is screaming time dilation in the past. If the secular scientists would let go of the cosmological principle, they have the biblical testimony in their face, basically. It's just demanded. Any other, I, I, I know I didn't answer that satisfactorily. I can't tell you how many hours I have put into this in the last few weeks to get back up to speed. It is not easy. <laughs> it is not easy. General relativity, I, I dug out my Landau lift shits. These are two Russian scientists. This is the sort of the standard stuff in uh, graduate school physics. You know, these the classical theory of fields, I was buried in this too. So it's, it's very hard to explain um, adequately. And so I'd be happy to talk to you more. Do, uh, what about, uh, as a physicist, do you have any thoughts on the discovery of the Higgs boson? No, not in the context of where I've been buried in general relativity for the last few weeks, no. I don't have any comments. Uh, well, maybe I do. There is particle physics and gravity are not, uh, there is no coherent theory that brings them together. So whether or not the Higgs boson has been found does not impact cosmology in my mind. Um, it's very weak. Yeah, it could be tied to dark matter in that, you know, it's a new particle that wasn't there before and it has a mass. Okay. All right, I see. So the Higgs bosons are the possibly making up the, the halos that, that it, it would have to be would you, transparent, I guess. Would your theory change? But it has mass, so it wouldn't be exotic. Okay. You know, everyone, that's the number one thing physics are looking for right now is dark matter. That's the big search. They're spending billions on it. If they discovered it in the next few years, what would that change in your theory? They discovered dark matter. Well, they would have to explain the spiral arms of the galaxy. They'd have to find, show me these invisible halos. I don't know what it means to find dark matter. You have to find dark matter in the right place to account for the behavior of the objects that are in space. You have to explain the one over R behavior that no one can explain by showing me that that matter is there. Certainly, that would, what would it do? Uh, 
I, nothing is going to change my position about a six-day creation six to ten thousand years ago, because that's based in God's word. So that's not good. What do we do to this theory? I, like all theories, they have to be revisited. But there are lots of problems with the Big Bang besides dark matter. And I, I don't even know what they're looking for. <laughs> it's just, it's a great, you know, like you said, the billions being spent on it is this need to, to prop up the Big Bang, to explain the universe without a creator, to demand the cosmological principle. If, if, if the secular science community would come up with a model that's not built on the cosmological principle, I would take notice. It's built on a materialistic foundation. So you think that trying to understand matter is a waste of money? A lot, large I certainly matter. didn't say that. Well, you said, you said the building is being spent on trying to discover, you know, what's inside an atom. That it's, it's, I'm, I'm not sure I see the huge connection between particle accelerator physics and locating matter in the cosmos to account for the pictures that we get from the telescopes. That's someone needs to come up with the theory that marries quantum mechanics and gravity, and no one has, and uh, there's not, because you can find a new particle in an accelerator, does not convince me of anything about the Big Bang cosmology, because they are quite disconnected in my mind. That's that 10 to the 120 disconnect between the predicted um, uh, prediction from quantum field theory of what the vacuum energy should be compared to the number required for cosmology. There's a huge disconnect. Quantum field theory is not helpful in my mind to understanding cosmology at this time. It's just not a waste to discover things. I certainly didn't say that. Never. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I guess, I guess to me there's, there's a basic principle of, of just, like, like you were saying about, about the, your assumptions going in, color your interpretations going out. Right. So what I would expect is if there was some big touted thing about um, dark matter having been discovered or whatever, um, there's like a philosophy that was behind the interpretation of the data. And if you go to that same data with a different philosophy, you, you may come up with, with some entirely different explanation. Um, so, so I think, I guess that would be kind of my answer is that, you know, you, 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 nobody comes to the data unbiased. Right. They all, they, all, they all have a belief system behind what they're looking at. And so, you know, I, I would say that that's, that's a lot of what's going on. You know, to, to me, you were talking about falsifiable theories, and I just think about, like, okay, 400 years ago or whatever, Pasteur comes up with, you know, uh, law of biogenesis, millions, billions, however many observations we've ever seen, never been falsified. Never. And yet, it is strongly believed by these atheists that life came from non-life. Right. But it always comes from life. In the real world, information always comes from intelligence, we see information in life, in the, in the DNA, and all the things, the process, and the stuff that goes on. That's the real world. Yeah. But then there's this belief that you can get information without intelligence. And, and, it, and it's just, it goes against real life, it goes against physics, it goes against science. But there's a belief that's behind it that makes them blind to that. Mm -hmm. I agree. Many of the headline type announcements about this or that being found are so intertwined with an unwieldy model that it's not clear what has been found conclusively that uh, 
when you come at it with a model to interpret it, you have those assumptions going in, like you said. The yeah. biological principle would be really easy to falsify. It's a falsifiable theory. Mm -hmm. And it has it. Right. I know, it's amazing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. Well, I, I mean, I think the Big Bang, if anything, could be false, could be called false, false by uh, the fixes that have been needed to be made to it, it would qualify as being bankrupt. So start with something new, <laughs> at least. So, okay, thank, you. Yeah, thank you all very much.